So even though I tend to talk a lot about the B theory of time here, um, it is a case that time is the most important notion that you could possibly believe in in order to center yourself towards a goal. You want to center yourself towards a goal perhaps for ultimately the hidden motive of having sexual reasons for this. It is simply attractive uh, to have a goal and you're trying to signal that you are attractive. Perhaps you could view this as a scam and then choose to not engage in believing in the notion of time in which case you would um, probably get stuck in a limbo in which you neither perceive the truth of eternalism or aim at something. <laughs> uh, so that would be a bad situation. So I would recommend going either way because I'm totally a relativist. I'm open to experience. I've gone both ways myself. My very first uh, dream that I tried to put into action was to become extremely rich. And that's why I was extremely interested in financial markets and actually raised money from people and invested uh, money and, and managed uh, money when I was 16. Um, after that, I switched over to the other dipole end of the spectrum in Hero's Journeys and went inward. So I tried to attain a state of selflessness where my thoughts would be as leaves fluttering in the wind, where I would not perceive uh, them to be directly belonging to anyone. And I attain this. So by sort of installing a metacognitive loop of mindfulness that I was no longer able to halt, uh, I entered what might be called a stream entry in Buddhism, where you feel anatta, the, the sense of there is no one to whom things are happening. There is just the flow. There is just a flux of happenings. I thought I was never going to come down from that, but eventually I came down from that, obviously. Uh, it's been years, and I'm pretty normal now. I don't uh, have the sort of meditator look, right? There's a certain look. that You, you become different. You become very weird um, in, in your mannerisms and and the way you, you act upon the world. So I think that if you could really uh, establish a sort of schedule that was sufficiently repetitive and, and you were sufficiently in tune with this practice and you, you were in general just in a state of high samadhi, high concentration uh, a lot of the time, perhaps you could sort of transcend the notion of time you wouldn't be computing time, and then that would be as good as anything, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, you know, so a Westerner might say, well, that's as good as being dead if you're not uh, living out all the different variety of human emotions. But I would say the monk isn't complaining. Uh, so, so I don't really see a problem with that, but it is unfeasible from if you're going to be in some other hero's journey here, like, and trying to make money and stuff, like, you, you can't function properly if you're, if you're believing, if you're trying to hide yourself within the conceptual bubble of eternalism, uh, as opposed to believing strongly, very strongly, in the notion of time. In fact, I think it's probably the single most important factor that is just conceptual, uh, because all the other factors, such as your general intelligence or having been in the right environment. Well, being in the right environment is probably the most important factor because, because of signaling theory, right? You, you need to get yourself into an environment where there are other high achievers and that's a single most important factor that's at your disposal in terms of uh, a, achieving something great. But uh, the, the conceptual the single most important conceptual thing that you could hold in your mind is a belief in time. Uh, it directly correlates with how successful you're going to be. So those of us who really believe in the future, who are very future oriented, tend to just in general be higher achievers than the people who live in the now. Because people who live in the now, it's more like, you know, they, 
they're not planning for the future. They're not establishing schedules. Uh, they certainly don't care about aging, right? They certainly don't care about aging and the fact that uh, the, until it's coming, until they're like 50 and they start feeling it in their knees, then they're 60, then they're, then they begin to think about it. But it's extremely strange to find people who are like, think about this when they're 15. And I certainly, you know, try to uh, front load my life with, with that knowledge. So what I did, for instance, was I listened to the book on repeat, uh, Ending Aging is the book that I'm referring to. Uh, Ending Aging, which was written by Aubrey de Grey and Michael Ray, um, I knew that the world was going to try to lead me astray. The world was going to be this flood of information. And the people around me, the internet itself, my own mind, was just going to be distracted with a bunch of stuff. So I forced myself to listen to the audiobook again and again and again and again and again and again on repeat. And it was painful. Um, but I did that so that I would not forget it. Uh, and uh, it, perhaps it worked because here I am telling you about this. I'm, I'm going to try to convince you that this is a good idea to, to focus your life around, especially disagreeable people. Because it's kind of like the only thing that could give your life the most reason to to rein yourself into an agriculturalist lifestyle as opposed to living in the pres present and just adopting the, the, the sort of lowering your standards uh, that I uh, described as the two bifurcating paths that you could choose once you know about level one signaling and you could no longer engage in level one signaling. Um, but first, let me say why time is so important. So. Jeff Bezos, right, the, most, the richest man on earth has this very catchy meme, which you should expect from someone who worked in Wall Street, which is a regret minimization framework. So this is what he uh, anchors his life around, is to look at himself when he is 80 and then look back on his life so as to not feel like this disjointed hologram that was just torn into pieces by, by the world, right? Get something that is going to make your life so as to find yourself completely whole and integrated into meaning when you are 80. So that you can look back on your life and think, that was something. And so it's actually not that difficult. It's not that difficult to operate anchored to your 80-year-old self and functionally succeed at uh, a regret minimization framework. So for instance, you could be a, a, a World Cup winning goalkeeper. And if your entire motivational system was centered around the thing that got people to clap at you and that happened to be you know winning the world cup for your nation you will die in peace when you're 80 you will have achieved this so it's a matter of relativity it's a matter of whatever you believe is is going to minimize your regrets that's what that will minimize your regrets if you believe in it the thing is for someone like me who already knows that we could do something uh, in terms of senescence, in terms of rejuvenating our cells and our tissues, and the day will come when eventually people will be permanently 25 years old, biologically 25, whereas in, in, as a matter of just actual age, they, they might be 90, 120, 130. And I know that this is, in fact, biologically possible because I am not deluded about a, the, the definition of what aging is. It's just a matter of damage, which can, in principle, be repaired. Once you know this, and you don't have the tendency towards a status quo bias, which most people have, uh, and perhaps that's just a trait of disagreeableness, I, then you can you can no longer unsee it, right? Once you see the truth, you can't unsee the truth. So it's important for me to work 
on that. Um, and of course, it would be extremely beneficial to both have an influence in terms of spreading the idea and be able to actually fund the research by allocating resources in the right way, whether through personal wealth or me being in a position of policy. That would have a lot more uh, influence upon the future Lycone than having uh, myself become a researcher. If I just become a researcher, I'm just, at most I can, uh, you, you know, just influence in, in the way that, that an average researcher would in a lifetime. Whereas if I have the money to purchase like myself a hundredfold, that would be far more useful, right? Um, and if I have the voice to influence a lot of people, then again, that's a lot more useful. So operating within that regret minimization framework uh, anchored to my 80-year-old self, so my own personal regret minimization framework, in other words, is one in which my 80-year-old self is not actually a stereotypical, decrepit, old 80-year-old self. It's one in where he actually did something to not be that. Uh, so that may sound like a crazy pipe dream, but it's actually not. And there has been progress in uh, rejuvenating mice, for instance. Mice are going to be a very happy uh, species in this century because they're getting a lot of uh, progress with their aging being reversed. So um, this regret minimization framework is is important in general for anyone but i want to focus right now on the people who tend to be disagreeable the people who tend to be disagreeable uh when they're th there's this thing right the level one signaling the level one signaling that i talked about where people don't don't understand their hidden motives within the level one signaling thing we have like two echelons the first one is where people signal to each other that Hey, we're all cooperating. We're all friends. We all, um, this is a safe space, so to speak, right? The, this entire reality. Uh, we're, we're not really enemies. So the way they signal this is by, uh, is with smiles, with uh, talking about politics, um, uh, crying about puppy dog ads, uh, gender neutral bathrooms whatever, right? And, and that's convincing to people. I'm not picking on people. That's convincing to most people. Like, that gives you the vibe that we all care, that we're all friendly. However, then there's people that notice the hypocrisy. They're like, wait a minute, you're crying about a puppy dog ad, and then the next moment, you're gushing in the juices of a sentient being that was murdered so that you could eat it. So, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So, they notice the hypocrisy, and perhaps they just notice the hypocrisy and try to, um, and don't do anything about it and just step outside of it. But then there are the sort of people who notice the hypocrisy and they become um, a second echelon of level one signaling. So they're still deceived about their hidden motives, but they try to up level these people by uh, perhaps becoming vegan, for instance. Of course, becoming vegan is itself just a form of level one signaling because you wouldn't actually be making uh, a difference whatsoever uh, by becoming a vegan. Whereas if you were going to make a difference, you know, you were, if you really cared, in other words, um, and, it, and it's not that you don't feel like you care, you certainly feel like you care, but if you really, really cared, for instance, if you were a vegan, uh, there would be no excuse for you to be watching this video right now. Every moment of you breathing, every moment of you being conscious and being capable of moving your body would be one of attempting to stop uh, this atrocity, right? If you believed that this was actually an atrocity. However, if we average people's actual behavior, whether in a single day, in a week, in a month, what they actually reveal is far different from from what they say they believe. Or So the thing is, we're trying to scalp all these easy signaling points. And and both people are doing it. The, the level one people and then the level two people. The level two people kind of just establish their own community. The level, Well, they're both level one people. I'm using these terms inconsistently. This is all level one signaling. 
This is the first echelon of level one signal, and this is the second echelon. In, in the second echelon, it doesn't really even work to impress these people. They kind of just think, oh, you're trying to up-level us. And they can they are, and they are. Um, it's just that they notice the hypocrisy here. Um, and then I would I would argue that the, the real level two signaling over here are the people who notice that you are absolutely driven by hidden motives, period. So so you're sort of kind of disembodied from this entire thing. You're you're hovering above all this and you're and then you ha you have to um, either choose to lower your standards completely and just be as selfish as possible, get away with what your body actually wants as much as possible, or go the other way and say, I am that which is sort of disembodied. I am that which is the goal. I am that which is the moral. And therefore, the, you know, this body is like a sacrificial pawn. I have to place it so that it does what I, what the moral wants. What the moral wants is far more important, so now I have to place bodies where they need to go. Um, and, and, and therefore get them, to, get them set up the right sorts of environments uh, and the right sorts of policies so that things get done. So, so that's the real level two signaling there. Um, so, so the thing is, why is um, longevity science and the quest for immortality because that's how you're going to perceive it, right? It's not actually a quest for immortality. It's actually just a matter of health span, extending what we're already doing. However, it does feel from the sort of player, from you as a player in this game perspective, um, it does feel like you're going for immortality. It feels like you're trying to save yourself. It feels like you're, you're in this to survive. When you're when you're engaged in the longevity movement, and that's extremely different from anything you get in any other movement, in any other, in competing at any other status hierarchy, in all the other ones. Since you're not convinced of the signaling things of cooperation, and if you're disagreeable, you tend to go into a state of enmity, into a state of okay, we're not really friends, I'm not convinced, and now you're making me compete at arbitrary things, I guess it's war then, I guess we're enemies. And so you become kind of an angry person, really. Or, uh, certainly I do. I become an angry person when I, I'm doing things that have absolutely no relevance and we're both going to die in the end anyway. It's like, okay, then uh, it's... It's a battle, right? It's like it's all meaningless and we're all going to die. Um, whereas if we're focusing on actually surviving, that's the most tangibly real thing, right? That's the most real thing that I could anchor myself around and believe that we are actually cooperating, that we actually believe in each other. Because everything else does not convince me that we believe in each other. It, it feels like a farce. It feels like we're just... My hypocrisy uh, meter goes off way too often so that I can I cannot take anything seriously. And therefore, that uh, is probably going to lead me to more often identify with the lowering standards as opposed to the raising standards. So... So that's my own strategy, is to focus on longevity science because it's the most tangible thing. And once we actually, once that raises us up to, to another level where we have created that space of, of sort of a more true form of cooperation, then we can begin to talk about the real goals at the level of eternalism. And, and those probably include finding the optimal states within the entire landscape of possible experiences. And I do believe that it's a matter of objective shapes that exist in reality. It's a matter of objective paths that could be traced through reality. And once you find them, 
you can maximize them as opposed to uh, wandering around permanently in a state of um, sort of breath first search where everything is as good as everything else and you're just the multiverse keeps performing everything we need to focus everything into the single best experience and that's probably like the end all be all of everything but before we get to that we need to focus on the more tangible things that get us to actually uh, get our act together in the first place. 